So uh, I think Axel correctly pointed out that one of the major problems within this patient blood management is the role of anemia. So uh, I will try to focus my, my speech on the risk involved with anemia in cardiac surgery, starting with something that has uh, nothing to do with cardiac surgery because this is actually non-cardiac surgery. Um, but actually, it's a very interesting study. It was recently published. And what is telling us this study is that in major surgery, there's a number of, of course, risk factors like chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, age, whatever you want. All these factors carry a specific risk of morbidity, but whenever you are, your patient is moderately anemic, this risk is double. And if it is severely anemic, it's almost three or four times more. So in non-cardiac surgery, the presence of anemia is a major risk factor for morbidity. And in cardiac surgery, we have a number, of course, of, of uh, studies that are dealing with this one. Uh, in 2002, it was probably one of the first observations, looking at severe anemia, let's say less than 10 hemoglobin values, this accounted for about 2.5%. And the long term, sorry, the short term, because these are actually days, outcome was severely worse in terms of survival in patients who were suffering from preoperative severe anemia. Of course, the others uh, tried to adjust for confounders, basically a, a little number of preoperative factors and other, other uh, possible covariates. But at the end of the day, uh, patient who is with an hemoglobin concentration less than 10, then the they actually had an odds ratio for mortality that was around 3. Remember this number because it's, you will always find that for severe anemia, the mortality, odds ratio for mortality in cardiac surgery is more or less around 3. Uh, actually, I would say the big problem with this study is that they probably adjusted for too few factors. This is a little bit of the covariate that we should consider within a model, and I will show you wh why in the next, uh, in the next uh, presentation. So uh, again, in this article, this is more recent, the authors explore, this is, let's say, moderate anemia. Again, 2.5% patient with moderate anemia had actually a significantly higher mortality rate. No difference if you go uh, above 12. And the important thing is that if you look at the, uh, not only, not just the mortality, but the morbidity as well, uh, of course, there is a higher rate of mortality. Uh, apparently, there is a, a lower rate of major adverse cardiac events, but more of the other complications. Again, they adjusted for a little number of confounders. What they did, again, this is interesting. They, they look at the Euro score as a single adjustment factor, and within this model, if they included hemoglobin less than 12, then again, they sorted out with a significant role of hemoglobin even after correction for the Euro score. And again, the OS ratio is 3.6. I think this is, a, this is a nice, simple, elegant way for uh, taking into account a certain uh, degree of covariates that are very important. We will see why. Then there is, of course, the usual uh, big study from Mangan and the MaxPy group. Again, this is retrospective. Uh, they were looking at different classes of hemoglobin, again, in, cardi in coronary artery bypass surgery. The interesting thing in this study was that looking at cardiac outcome, they could not see differences in cardiac morbidity and mortality. And this is something that is confirmative of the, the studies that I show you where the cardiac morbidity was not that bad. Uh, I mean, could even make sense. I mean, anemia has probably just one possible advantage that is maybe a more, uh, <coughs> is a less thromboembolic complication, maybe. This is just an hypothesis, but again, if we, they were looking at the <coughs> non-cardiac outcome, so again, they saw an impressive increase of 
uh, this outcome with decreasing levels of hemoglobin, again with a strong significance. And finally, uh, Kavan is used to do this propensity adjusted study. He did this one with a very, very nice way for adjusting again. So he was looking at uh, moderately anemic patients. And if looking at the unadjusted relationship, the OS ratio is 3.6. Again, adjusting with logistic regression is 2. Then he did a propensity matches sample. He found out 2. Uh, moderate anemia has an OS ratio for mortality. That is more or less 2. Severe anemia is 3, 3.5. Because in this study, actually Kavan excluded all the patients with severe anemia. So it's just moderate anemia. So the existing level of evidence seems to demonstrate that if you have a moderate anemia from 10 to 12 hemoglobin values, then your risk is around 2. And if you have severe anemia, it's more than 3. So uh, this is a brand new information because it was accepted by the, the annals uh, one week ago. So you will see this study from our group uh, within the next months, but I can anticipate some of the results. What we were looking at was severe anemia, basically, uh, with a propensity matching. So something that was still missing because propensity matching from K1 was for moderate anemia. So what we, uh, I have a, a good database with around uh, 14, 15,000 patients, so adult patients. So uh, basically we could identify 400 patients with severe anemia, hemoglobin less than 10. And another big, big pool of patients with no anemia or no severe anemia, let's say. Uh, the important thing is that, of course, I would like to, you to notice that the number of significant differences between the group is impressive. So, of course, patients with severe anemia, they have an incredible number of bad, of comorbid conditions. Someone very, very bad, like chronic dialysis. They are more prone to reduce surgery, to even to complex surgery. So, actually, of course, it's difficult. It's difficult with retrospective study comparing severe anemia with no severe anemia because we, get, we must get rid of all these confounders. And at the end of the day, what we did was, again, building a multivariable model with a propensity score, and we sorted out with two groups that wa were actually quite homogeneous. But look at this, to, to find out homogeneous group, we had to look at patient with a very high logistic euro score. It's around 14. So it means that these patient, anemic patient, basically, they have a very, very high risk profile. If we want to compare with no anemic patient, we need a huge number of patients, and we need to extract a similar patient population with the same confounders. And actually, we check for this. We have been looking at something like 25 possible coverage, possible confounders. This was the difference be before match, and this was in the two groups, the difference after match, and you know that 10% of standardized difference is considered absolutely adequate to say that these two groups were homogeneous. So we are now quite sure that we have two homogeneous group of patients to be compared. Severely anemic versus no severely anemic. So let's go to the outcome. Of course, many more transfusions. It goes without saying, if you are anemic, you will be transfused. But higher stroke rate in anemic patients, higher rate of major morbidity. That was a combination of, according to the STS, a combination of five uh, major uh, complications and an importantly significant higher mortality. Actually, these were dying exactly as the Euroscore was telling us, and this one uh, about half. Longer mechanical ventilation, longer ICU stay. And the important thing is that once we analyze the patient population, dividing by uh, six types of, of uh, distribution, this is a severely anemic patient. But even patients with moderate anemia, they did demonstrate still a higher mor mortality rate. And only with patients with uh, a higher an hemoglobin level higher than 12, we could really find out patients that were doing 
uh, that were doing good. So what we did at this stage was, uh, as, I, as the one of the first articles that I showed you, we were looking at, can we improve the quality of the existing predictive scores by adding this concept of severe anemia? So we simply used the existing score and we adjusted for severe anemia. And what we found out was, again, that uh, depending on the risk model that we were trying to adjust, severe anemia was playing a role uh, with an ulceration from 3 to 3.6. And then we tried the adjustment. And what is important is that uh, I'm no, I don't know how familiar you are with risk score, but basically we have accuracy, calibration, clinical performance. Accuracy is discriminative power. Well, discriminative power by correcting for severe anemia was not changing that much in all the risk scores. Look at this. The area under the core, yes, it did improve, but not that much. But this is not what we, are, we should try to look at. We uh, should be much more interested in the calibration and clinical performance. Look at this. This was the observed mortality. This is a, a series of about 9,000 patients from my files. The observed mortality was 3%. The predicted one before adjustment was overestimated by the Euroscore, and we know that Euroscore is overestimating, a little bit underestimated by the North and New England, and correctly estimated by the ACIF <coughs> score. Then if we do the adjustment, then of course in the whole patient population, we don't change the predictions that much because severely anemic patients are actually 2% of the patient population. But if we look at the subgroup of anemic, severely anemic patients, then you see that without adjustment, we s always severely underestimate mortality. There was 10%, but after this adjustment, then we can get the real the real numbers. This means that if you have an anemic, a severely anemic patient, and you simply do not adjust for this, then you will always say to this patient that the risk is low, but actually it is very high. So uh, there's a number of possible interpretation of this link between anemia and bad outcomes. Actually, I don't want to stress what probably the other speakers will, will address, but it is known that excessive hemodilution during CPB is associated with a number of bad outcomes. So preoperative anemia is for sure a risk factor for, uh, for uh, hemodilution during CPB. And actually what we could demonstrate in this study uh, three or four years ago was that if we look at uh, preoperative anemia and hemodilution, this is preoperative anemia. This is lowest hematocriton CPB. They are both associated with operative mortality and morbidity. But actually, uh, let's look at this one. The most important thing seems to be the lowest hematocriton CPB. Because if you are anemic, but you can maintain an, an hematocriton CPB uh, above 28, then your incidence of major morbidity stay low. But if you are anemic and he, you don't correct for this during CPB, then you have a significant increase in major <laughs> morbidity. So if we have an anemic patient, first things to do, I mean, first, one of the things that sh we should do is looking at all the possible strategies to minimize hemodilution during CPB. Of course, anemia is triggering a higher transfusion rate. Of course, anemia is decreasing the exercise tolerance of our patients. And exercise tolerance is, again, something that is changing every kind of risk factors. If you are a good performer, then, of course, your risk is much lower than if you are a bad performer for each of these uh, risk factors. And finally, uh, just to mention, anemia has a strong connection with chronic heart failure and chronic kidney disease. This is a so-called cardio renal anemia syndrome and we know that there is this complex intercorrelation between kidney heart anemia and so this too will reduce erythropoiesis and then we will have, will have this link through the sympathetic nervous system and this again will reduce erythropoiesis but anemia as well through renal ischemia vasoconstriction will deteriorate kidney function. This will lead to a decrease in the erythropoietin and then again reduce erythropoiesis. So a very bad, 
bad vicious circles that is leading to an, really a higher risk of this patient. And actually, if you look at the NGAL, the NGAL is strongly correlated with acute kidney injury. You see, it's a very, very uh, early predictive marker of kidney injury, but actually, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that everyone is aware of the fact that it is as well associated not just on hemodilution on CPB, but even on preoperative anemia. And patients with preoperative anemia, they have a high NGAL level because according to the study, NGAL is directly inhibiting erythropoiesis. So it's a very complex behavior between kidney and gall anemia. And at the end of the day, we, we don't even know if what we have observed that he, hemodilution during CPB is deteriorating <coughs> kidney function if this is simply due to hemodilution or even to the preoperative anemia. So it's a very complex model. I think there's still role for a, a huge number of information again. Thank you very much. Naive question, but in your in your preoperative slide, yep. in which you looked, you had a whole list of comorbidities, anemia and no anemia. I was yep. surprised to see COPD with no difference between the two. I yep. would have thought that uh, yes. severe COPD should 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 yeah. higher hemoglobins. Yeah, probably. You, yes. Were you surprised by that? Yes, not? yes, but yes or no? Because uh, I mean, actually, we had to stick to the. In my database, we were following the definition of the Euro score. That for COP are absolutely, let's say, mm, a little bit naive because it's simply I, I I am I am a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease according to the to the Euro score because I'm allergic and I'm under regular use of. Uh, but, but you saw I ran a marathon three weeks ago. Sure. So <laughs> actually, actually, uh, yes, you're totally right. If you have a severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, then your hemoglobin value is higher normally. I'm, s I'm still struggling with how much of this morbidity is actually related to the actual anemia and how much of it relates to the process by which the anemia occurs. I mean, Presumably, if you if you run a trial where you correct the anemia, if you can, how much of these morbidities are going to disappear? I mean, do you have a, an opinion I on think that? No, so th there are some trials looking at this, this probably uh, running presently, but you're totally right. But this is exactly what is happening with transfusions. I mean, if you look at... All this is this a uh, uh, big deal of information coming from retrospective trial, observational, okay? And this is raising the hypothesis that if you correct the anemia, then the outcome will be better. But nobody knows. We sh should control with a randomized control trial. Uh, if you do this with transfusion, we have a huge amount of, of studies that are telling us the transfusions are bad. But the randomized control trials that we have presently, uh, they are not telling this. If, if they are simply telling us that the outcome is the same. That is a very good reason for not transfusing the patient. But one would expect that the outcome in the studies with liberal versus restrictive transfusion policies would result in a worse outcome in the liberal strategy. That is not the case. So you're totally right. Nobody knows if we can, if this is a modifiable or non-modifiable risk factor. Uh, I think propensity, propensity is the best that we can do, but it's absolutely not necessarily the right, the right way, the definitive way. Any more questions? <coughs> okay, well, I think in the interest of time, Thank you, you better press on.